In 1974, Francis Ford Coppola made a movie about surveillance called The Conversation, in which Gene Hackman plays a surveillance expert named Harry Call. Surveillance is the art not just of listening, but of pinpointing which sounds, which frequencies, are the important ones. The tapes always put me to sleep. Since when are you here to be entertained? I'm here. Sometimes it's nice to know what they're talking about. I don't care what they're talking about. I want is a nice, fat recording. To Harry, this is only a job, and just as he absolves himself from caring about what his targets, Mark and Anne, are saying, or why his client wants to record them, the soundtrack shifts into discordant music. In an unwelcome irony for Harry Call, his landlady has been reading his mail and letting herself into his apartment, introducing a theme in the movie best articulated by Hamlet's Ophelia. The observed of all observers, quite, quite down. On this particular day, Harry's landlady unlocks his apartment door to leave him a bottle of champagne for his birthday. And it turns out there's a discrepancy regarding Harry's age. The landlady guesses 44, and Harry tells his friend he's turning 42. But for someone in the business of gathering and pinpointing sound frequency, and considering the fact that Harry's also a musician, both numbers are significant. In the harmonic series, they express the musical notes of F and F sharp, Two notes that show up in both Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut and Shakespeare's King Lear. and which highlight the devil in music, the tritone. It's a tone that's jarring to the ear when played against the harmonic fundamental note of C. And it's also the note that's displaced the perfect fifth, G, at the center or mise of the diatonic scale. For more information on that, please read chapter 14 of the next octave. In his blog, Austin Ross writes that the dissonant soundtrack of the conversation is full of tritones. And as we'll see, frequencies aren't always meant to entertain. Surveillance frequencies, for example, perform a different series of tasks, as do mining frequencies, and the intervals between these working frequencies have nothing to do with pleasing the ear. There's some very obvious symbolism in the movie as well but only to those with eyes to see. When Call delivers his recording, he approaches this sculpture outside Embarcadero Center, called Two Columns with Wedge, by Willie Gutman. From this perspective, the sculpture looks like a giant pipe from a pipe organ, or maybe a dog whistle, too high in frequency for humans to hear. As Harry finally isolates Mark's jumbled, initially inaudible comment, He'd kill us if he got the chance. He looks at a photo of Anne with the words Spanish Fleet above her head. The words are from an inscription on the park's Dewey Monument, the large column in the center of Union Square Park that amazingly survived the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. The monument commemorates the U.S. victory in the Spanish-American War, and according to the State Department's website, the Spanish-American War of 1898 ended Spain's colonial empire 
in the western hemisphere and secured the position of the united states as a pacific power spain's influence in the u s will become relevant to this larger story later in the video the dewey monument today is very different from the first one erected in nineteen o three the original was much shorter with only six sections of its column shaft, compared with nine today. To survive the intense shaking of the 7.9 magnitude quake, the monument must have used a fairly deep ground anchor penetrating into the earth. And it's interesting to see that the intact monument ended up at the center or mees of the burn area map after the quake. Here, we can see a mantle or stone ridge overhung the inscription on the original base, a feature that's gone today. What hasn't changed, though, is the fact that Winged Victory, on the very top of the Dewey Monument, still holds a trident. Allusions to the plays of Shakespeare are peppered throughout the conversation. Harry Call's last name could refer to Prince Hamlet himself, who was born a call bearer, something his mother, Queen Gertrude, alludes to when describing his veiled eyelids. A call is the amniotic sac, still clinging to an infant's head and body, looking like a veil, and described as a shimmery coating or garment. Because of this, in Elizabethan times, such children were thought to occupy both sides of the proverbial veil, and to be privy to secrets of the dead. It's because of his call at birth that Hamlet was thought to have a strong connection to the ghost of his dead father. A well-known act of surveillance is carried out in the play Hamlet. It's done by Polonius hiding behind a veil. Polonius tells King Claudius that behind the heiress I'll convey myself to hear the process. Tis meet that some more audience than a mother should overhear the speech of vantage. He's hiding behind an heiress, a tapestry that conceals an alcove. This act of surveillance gets Polonius killed when Hamlet suspects an intruder and stabs Polonius through the heiress. The word surveillance includes the root word veil, which originally meant vellum in Latin. The prefix sur can mean either above or beyond, which suggests that surveillance is the act of moving beyond the veil, though many prepositions would seem to work, including behind or even through the veil. The fact that Claudius poisoned Hamlet's father in his ear suggests something inherently dangerous involved in the act of listening. He'll kill you if he gets a chance. I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of murder. The conversation is a movie about the observed of all observers, not to mention the hypocrisy of a surveillance expert insisting on his own privacy. It's about the juxtaposition of transparent raincoats with two sided mirrors. It's about an invisible man, a modern day Prospero from Shakespeare's Tempest, transmuting the pine tree into an aerial antenna at which Neptune himself would shake his trident. Many people think the Pine Gap military facility in the center of Australia was named for the cloven pine in the Shakespeare play The Tempest. The tree that imprisoned Ariel until the magician Prospero gaped the tree and freed the spirit. Some also think this town, Alice Springs, near Pine Gap, was named for the character in Alice in Wonderland, a girl whose mind goes straight to Australia as she tumbles down a rabbit hole in a down-under, 
underground experience. I wonder if I shall fall right through the earth. How funny it'll seem to come out among the people that walk with their heads downward. Please, ma'am, is this New Zealand or Australia? The mainstream narrative, though, would disagree on both counts. The namesake of Alice Springs is given as a woman named Alice Todd, the wife of Charles Todd, who built a telegraph station here in the early 1870s. And Pine Gap was named for its proximity to Heavy Tree Gap, just a few miles away, and which isn't a gap in a tree, but in a ridge of earth. That's the explanation, but we might wonder how Heavy Tree Gap got its name. A large heavy tree toppled over is exactly how this landscape appears from above. Various gaps in this lower ridge cause it to appear offset almost as if its pieces are giant broken logs that have fallen over. If a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? Australia's Pine Gap is all about sound. As a surveillance facility, Pine Gap listens to sounds. Despite the presence of Alice Todd, young Alice is still relevant to our story, and her time in Wonderland was also punctuated by sounds. Teacups rattling, the pig baby sneezing, dishes crashing, a griffin shrieking, a slate pencil squeaking. But in Wonderland, nobody else seemed to actually be listening, at least to Alice. In fact, except for the Queen listening, a hat tip to government surveillance, it's mainly Alice who is hearing things. While her listeners in the story are few, she's hearing noises upwards of 50 times during the story, while wondering if anybody is hearing her. My name is Harry Call. Can you hear me? Like Wonderland, the island in the Tempest is also full of sounds. The first line of the play is a stage direction, a tempestuous noise, linking the storm to the sound it makes, and the setting is described early on by Caliban as an isle full of noises. Watchdogs barking, roosters crowing, aerial moaning, a thousand twangling instruments, and sea nymphs ringing a ding-dong bell. Some of the worst noises on Prospero's Island were created by the witch, Caliban's mother. This damned witch, Sycorax, for mischiefs manifold and sorceries terrible to enter human hearing. She had imprisoned Ariel for refusing to do her bidding. And as Prospero reminds him, thy groans did make wolves howl and penetrate the breasts of ever angry bears. It was a torment to lay upon the damned. Prospero commits several acts of surveillance in the Tempest, a task he describes at one point as observation strange. When he's present during the conversations of others, his magical charms give him the power of invisibility. In his own words, my high charms work, and these, mine enemies, are all knit up in their distractions. They now are in my power, which is always the reason to perform surveillance, to gain power over one's enemies. Something to keep in mind, considering Pine Gap's habit of surveilling the phone conversations of U.S., British, and Australian citizens. In addition to the name Pine Gap, the surveillance base near Alice Springs also has a code name, Operation Rainfall a weather event precipitating the need for eaves, and from which comes, coincidentally, the term eavesdrop. One detail to note from the conversation is that Harry Call wears a raincoat all through the movie, even on sunny days. Rainfall in the Australian outback can be unpredictable, causing both floods and drought. 
Obviously, the desert areas of the Australian bush suffer extreme drought during certain periods of the year, and it's likely that Pine Gap is patched into the weather modification apparatus of HARP. But that's no secret. This admission is from an Australian government website. Droughts and flooding, though, aren't the only problems here. The soil conditions in this desert climate are also highly saline, meaning they have a high salt content. When Edward John Eyre, the man for whom the Eyre Highway is named, first explored the outback in 1840, he documented this and made an odd comment in his journal. The very saline nature of the soil in the surrounding country made even the rainwater salt after lying for an hour or two upon the ground. Obviously, rainfall itself doesn't contain much salt, but this description of Australia reflects oddly similar imagery involving salt water in Hamlet, The Tempest, and Alice in Wonderland. Prospero's island in Shakespeare's Tempest is also salty, and Caliban alludes to that when he's insulting Trinculo. He shall drink naught but brine, for I'll not show him where the quick freshes are. Caliban also refers to the island's brine pits. In Hamlet, we actually see imagery of salt rain in the reactions of Laertes and Ophelia to their father's death, their father being Polonius, the one eavesdropping behind the heiress veil. Tears seven times salt burn out the sense and virtue of mine eye, and on his grave rains many a tear. We see something very similar in The Tempest when Ariel tells Prospero what's happening with the sailors. The good old Lord Gonzalo, his tears run down his beard like winter's drops from eaves of reeds. Salt water raining into an Elsinore grave and Caliban's brine pits form a collection of related imagery, similar to one of Australia's brine pits that Iyer records in his journal. Following the arm downwards, I came to a long reach of water in its channel, about two feet deep, perfectly clear and as salt as the sea, and I even fancied that it had that peculiar green tinge which seawater, when shallow, usually exhibits. Ayer's description here is brought to life by Antonio and Sebastian in The Tempest. The ground, indeed, is tawny, with an eye of green in it. Brine pit imagery appears in Alice in Wonderland's Pool of Tears, where Alice, still underground, literally trapped within the soil, has cried gallons of tears. She was up to her chin in salt water. She soon made out that she was in the pool of tears which she had wept when she was nine feet high. Her experience echoes the myth of Pyrene, the sea nymph who cried so much over the loss of her son, Sencrius that she transmuted herself into the Pyrene Spring of Corinth. Coming full circle, we find that Pyrene means of the osiers, or the willow, the weeping tree that grew aslant over the brook into which Hamlet's Ophelia fell and drowned, pulled down by her wet garments. Alice worries that she'll drown in her own tears and spends an entire chapter attempting to dry her clothes. But it's in the tempest that the most remarkable thing happens to clothes that are immersed in brine, as the sailors are amazed to find that our garments, being as they were drenched in the sea, hold notwithstanding their freshness and glosses, being rather new dyed than stained with salt water. Water, salt, and wet garments seem to be a theme connecting these three stories with Pine Gap as Operation Rainfall. But stranger still, this theme may be relevant to Pine Gap's other codename, Operation Merino. History tells us that Merino sheep were first bred in Spain in the 1200s, 
because of their ability to produce fine wool for garments as opposed to coarse wool for rugs. One area known for its merino population is the Pyrenees mountain region of northern Spain that bleeds up into southern France. Merinos were so prized by the Spanish that they held a strict monopoly over the breed, and unauthorized possession was punishable by death. Eventually, though, Merino sheep began showing up in places other than Spain. Hernán Cortés brought Spanish sheep, including Merinos, to several missions in Mexico in 1538. We might say the Spanish fleet brought over the Spanish fleece that eventually populated the southwestern United States. According to this history on sheep in the American Southwest, in 1598, Juan de Onate, who was originally from the Pyrenees Mountains in Spain, brought with him large flocks of Navajo churro and merinos to the Rio Grande Valley. This area will become important to our story later. Merinos had also showed up in Australia by the late 1700s. They've been very well suited to the dry saline condition of the soil in both the southwest U.S. and the Australian outback, and there are several Merino herds just south of Alice Springs and Pine Gap at Rollina Station. It's the link between Merinos and the Golden Fleece that may explain why Pine Gap uses Merino as another of its code names. In a 1973 paper published in Nature, doctors Ryder and Hedges suggested that the legend of the Golden Fleece may actually refer to fine wool, the same kind produced by Merinos. But if Merinos weren't bred for fine wool by the Spanish until the 13th century AD, how do we explain the legend of a golden fleece of fine wool from real sheep circulating in 1300 BC? The answer, as many of our mysteries do, involves the Tartarians, or rather, the Scythians, living west of Greater Tartary. According to Peter Halen's Microcosmos, published in 1633, this area called Tartaria was originally known as Scythia, and the Scythians eventually became the Huns, Franks, Bulgarians, Tartarians, Visigoths, and several others. In their 1973 paper, the doctors point to a fragment of fine wool cloth found in a Scythian tomb in Crimea dating to the 5th century BC. The Crimean Peninsula where this Scythian or Tartarian wool was found, sits at the north end of the Black Sea. And Colchis, where the Greek legend places the Golden Fleece, is just over here on the Black Sea's eastern shore, only 500 miles away. And oddly enough, the Crimean Peninsula sits directly on the Sylvanite Triangle that I've discussed in earlier videos a triangle that connects the four major sylvanite locations of Kalgoorlie, Transylvania, Romania, Kirkland Lakes, Ontario, and Cripple Creek, Colorado. As the history of many groups living in the area of Tartary has been scrubbed, this could be why we're having to rediscover this link now. Dr. Carl Schuker states on his blog, that its age and Crimean locality collectively confirm that fine wool was indeed associated with the Black Sea region and at a time near that of the Golden Fleece's appearance and Jason's quest for it. In the story of Jason and the Argonauts, Jason is identified as the hero when he loses one of his sandals in the river Anoros. The meaning of the river's name is explained on Wiktionary as waterless, at which point the website blathers on about the prefix an being attached to an unknown word for water. My guess, considering its context, is that the unknown root word of oris is related to the Latin word orum, meaning gold, and from which we get the AU designation for gold in the periodic table. Likely, the Anoris was a river with alluvial gold, which is gold deposited by water. 
and gold tends to show up in water where there are high salt concentrations, such as in seawater and brine pits. Jason is assisted on his quest for the Golden Fleece by Hera, the Greek goddess of marriage. He's also assisted by the sorceress Medea, a female version of Prospero, as both are in the habit of causing people to fall into sleep. When Jason arrives in Colchis, he's given tasks to perform before he can take possession of the Golden Fleece. One is to yoke the fire-breathing Colchis bulls and plow a field with them. The bulls have hooves of bronze, a reddish-colored alloy that will be treading the furrows. This color in connection to the soil is symbolic, as Medea gives Jason an ointment to protect him not only from the fire breath, but also from iron, the oxide of which turns soil red. The golden fleece is hanging from an oak tree, with a dragon coiled around its base. This illustration shows the dragon already slain, but its tail retains its coiled nature. And as this illustration shows, when Jason slays the dragon, it bleeds red into the earth. This will become important later. The usual explanation given for the presence of gold-colored fleece has been that fleeces are often used to catch particles of alluvial gold flowing downstream in a river. But science is now telling us that the merinos produce a pigment called lanarin in their sweat and urine that gives a golden tinge to their wool. Notice that the name given to this pigment, lanarin, is related to the name of the river Anoros, and both are related to the root word mentioned earlier, orum, meaning gold. Merinos are the only breed known to produce lanarin, and they also happen to be well suited to the desert conditions of the Australian outback, so again it's not surprising that we find several herds of them just south of Pine Gap and Alice Springs. This area south of Pine Gap includes the Nullarbor Plain. A few months ago, a YouTuber named Raphael Hungria said he'd discovered a star fort in this area, but the feature he found is really more rectangular than star-shaped. And although it's marked as a star fort on Google Maps, the term Fort Estrella simply means star fort in Portuguese, Hungria's native language. It's likely he's the one who labeled it and there are several similar rectangular dams and brine pits all over this area. The saline or salty nature of this soil is toxic to most plants, and could explain the lack of trees in the Nullarbor, which means, of course, zero trees. But as Iyer explored the area, he wrote in his journal that in some parts of the large plains, I had observed traces of the remains of timber of a larger growth than any now found in the same vicinity, and even in places where none at present exists. Can these plains of such very great extent, and now so open and exposed, have been once clothed with timber? And if so, by what cause or process have they been so completely denuded as not to leave a single tree within a range of many miles? I believe there were once trees here, very large trees so it's likely the soil didn't always exhibit these high levels of salt. So what changed? One factor may have been an increased salinity of the soil due to the introduction of the golden fleeced merino. The word merino contains the root mare, meaning sea. The suffix eno means little, so the merino is being termed a little sea, a source of salt water and the description of the isolated pigment lanarin producing its gold fleece sounds a lot like black alkali, the sodium carbonate residue of certain extremely salty soils. If we zoom in on this large grid pattern in the Nullarbor, we find a few more circular or rectangular dams that I've marked with dots. Many of these are actually metal water tanks surrounded by paddocks for sheep, 
and several exhibit an area of blackened soil. According to the Wool Industries Research Association, in a paper published in 1931, the second stage of isolating lanarin involved an incorporation with ether in solution, which was then evaporated. The result was a black, tarry residue with a most disagreeable smell, resembling black alkali that's been described as sticky ooze, or as this article from 1947 states, vile-smelling, gumbo-like muds. One of the prime plants on which merinos feed is saltbush, and it's one of the few plants that can withstand the presence of black alkali. The conversion of sodium chloride into sodium carbonate, or black alkali, involves ammonia and brine. It's a patented process called the Solvay process that's performed in a lime kiln. But what if the urine of merinos, which of course contains ammonia, is converting the sodium chloride from the saline soil and salt bush into sodium carbonate? Elsewhere in the Wool Industries Research Association paper, the pigment lanarin was shown to be precipitated as, again, a dark and somewhat sticky mass. And in discussing lanarin's solubility, the paper states that it dissolves readily in dilute alkali or sodium carbonate, which is the defining constituent of black alkali. This might cause us to wonder if excreted lanarin could be causing this black substance, potentially black alkali, localized around these sheep troughs. Obviously, we can't know simply from looking at pictures. Another possibility is that this black area is a concentration of tar and sulfur to prevent hoof rot in the sheep that's been spread out on the soil so the herd will tread through it. But the possibility that we might be looking at black alkali indicates a potential for the presence of monatomic elements in the soil. Monatomic elements in the form of a white powder that's found in deposits of black alkali have existed since ancient times, having been found in Egyptian temples. So the possibility not only exists, but seems to be cryptically mentioned by Prospero in The Tempest. To tread the ooze of the salt deep, to run upon the sharp wind of the north, to do me business in the veins of the earth when it is baked with frost. Here we have the combined imagery of soil, salt, ooze, and a resulting white powder likened to frost. But frost is cold. So what does Prospero mean when he describes the white frost as baked? Sheep exhibiting golden fleece are in a state of jaundice, a condition of accumulating too much yellow pigment in the bile. In fact, the paper published in 1931 by the Wool Industries Research Association states that the resemblance between disposition to golden coloration in sheep and jaundice in man is so marked as to warrant discussion. The yellow pigment of jaundice starts out as a reddish-orange pigment because it contains the breakdown of red blood cells, and the pigment's name is actually red bile or bilirubin, bili meaning bile and rubin meaning red. The word reminds me of the song repeated throughout the conversation film. The body's turnover of blood cells requires the processing of old hemoglobin, and the heme of hemoglobin is the mineral iron. The Wool Industries report goes on to say that the kidneys of those with hereditary jaundice are rich in iron. We can extrapolate 
that sheep with golden fleece are experiencing the same effects, including high levels of heme iron in the urine. And this might explain why the land in areas historically known for the presence of golden fleeced merinos have red soil containing high levels of iron oxide. We find these red soils where merinos have historically grazed, places like the Pyrenees Mountains, where they were bred, the American Southwest, where they were brought in the 1500s, and the Australian Outback, where merinos were brought in the 1700s. The presence of iron oxide in the soil brings to mind Jason's helper, the goddess Hera, who was described by Homer as ox-eyed. The homophone of oxide and ox-eyed could be dismissed as a cute coincidence, but Hera was the Greek goddess of women, family, and childbirth. As such, she represented blood, the blood of menstruation, childbirth, and kinship. More than a thousand years before Hera was worshipped by the Greeks, the Egyptian goddess Isis represented a deified form of menstrual blood called starfire that was considered both ingestible and medicinal for the gods and rulers. The Roman Church vilified the starfire ritual, and though they encouraged the Eucharistic drinking of Christ's blood in the form of wine, the Church likened the non-Christian ingestion of blood to vampirism. In light of this, it's an interesting coincidence that one of the four main locations of sylvanite on Earth is in Transylvania. Because Hera is the goddess of family blood, her Roman counterpart Juno is present at the wedding of Ferdinand and Miranda in the Tempest to bless their bond. This is because the wedding of Ferdinand and Miranda is an alchemical one, the incorporation of iron oxide and saline soil. This is hinted at in their names. Ferdinand is a combination of the medieval term denandery, a decorative object made from a base metal alloy like bronze or brass, and the prefix fer for ferrum or iron. He and Prospero provide a comic moment in the play, alluding to Ferdinand's iron through a connection of starfire in the blood and his liver, the liver being the primary storage site of iron in the body. The strongest oaths are straw to the fire in the blood. I warrant you, sir, the white, cold virgin snow upon my heart abates the ardor of my liver. And even a mention of snow, a white powder similar to Prospero's baked frost and a possible reference to powdered metals. Miranda's name suggests a mire, especially when Ferdinand spells it out for us, calling her admired. Miranda then repeatedly describes Ferdinand as noble. But this description is premature. He won't become noble until he marries his iron with her mire and lays a foundation for transmuted metals, the noble ones like gold, platinum, or palladium as he tells us, referring to his own task in Act Three, some kinds of baseness are nobly undergone. Likely, it's Ariel who will help him make a metallic bond, as Ariel describes his attack on the ship as the alchemical processes of chemically separating, heating, and incorporating. Sometime I'd divide and burn in many places on the topmast, the yards, and the boresprit would I flame distinctly, then meet and join. And note that Ariel calls the bowsprit a boresprit, not as a pole pertaining to the bow of the ship, but to the act of boring into earth. In addition to Juno, the Roman counterpart to Hera, we also find the goddess Ceres at the wedding of Ferdinand and Miranda. Ceres is the goddess of fertility, agriculture, and grain. She's described in the play as bounteous, providing turfy mountains where live nibbling sheep and flat meads thatched with stover them to keep. 
The stover left for the sheep to graze is essentially dried stalks of harvested grain. And this stover is set against the food conjured during the night by the spirits and elves, who by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make, whereof the ewe not bites. This contrasting of sheep fodder is key. It's pitting acidic food, the unripe grapes conjured by the elves, with alkaline food, the stover, the stalks of harvested grains. One, the ewes refuse to bite, the sour, acidic grapes. And one, they happily nibble, the alkaline stover, which keeps them or sustains them. This isn't dietary advice for humans. In both cases, the food is referenced as eaten or not eaten by sheep and its relevance has to do with the sheep's ability to produce golden fleece. The 1931 paper on Lanarin states that golden fleece is related to the pH of the sheep's urine, which is dependent on diet. Switching to cattle, the researchers noted that most cereal straw, the food provided by bounteous series, produced alkaline urine, Sheep disposed to golden fleece only produced it when eating alkaline straw. When eating acidic food, like unripe grapes, they would not produce golden fleece. The point is that the grapes must be ripe, and of course this emphasis on ripe grapes shows up in the play when Alonzo the king notices that Trinculo is reeling ripe. Where should they find this grand liquor that hath gilded them? Trinculo has been consuming grapes in the form of wine, but a ripe grape has the alkalinity to gild, to coat something in gold. And King Alonzo would know this about gilding because his name means noble. He's older and wiser and more experienced in this than his son Ferdinand, who remains a base alloy of iron that won't become noble until his chemical wedding later in the play. The same symbolism shows up in Bacon's New Atlantis, where a cluster of gilded grapes, which means they're coated with gold, is carried around in public ceremony. This symbol didn't originate with Bacon, but it's not surprising that many of these same themes regarding gold and fleece, metal alloys and white powder, even cloven pine, also show up in Bacon's work. For example, in Experiment 500, Bacon covers four means proposed to treat a sick tree. Bacon's preferred way to treat a tree that's sick is to perforate the body of the tree, to cleave the pine, as it were. We see this image again in Experiment 652, where Bacon describes a cloven or gaped pine and the presence of a white powder. It is reported that fir and pine, especially if they be old and putrefied, though they shine not as some rotten woods do, yet in the sudden breaking they will sparkle like hard sugar. Bacon's broken pine is relevant here not only to the Tempest and the Pine Gap military facility, but also to a procedure referenced in the 1931 Wool Research paper, the Pine Splinter Test. It's a process involving a cutting of pine to expose fresh wood that's then treated with hydrochloric acid. When the researchers then placed isolated lanarin pigment on the treated pine, they obtained a positive, red-colored result, indicating the presence of pyrroles. A pyrrole is an organic compound found in soil, creosote, and the pigment lanarin. Its name comes from the Greek pyros, meaning reddish or fiery, from the reaction used to detect it, the red color that it imparts to wood when moistened with hydrochloric acid. The Greek king Pyrrhus is mentioned in Hamlet for avenging his own father's death. 
and the bard then beats us over the head with imagery pertaining to Hera. With blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and impasted with the parching streets, roasted in wrath and fire, and thus oversized with coagulate gore, with eyes like carbuncles. Much of this imagery relates directly back to Hera and the blood of kinship, fathers, mothers, daughters, sons. But baking and coagulating that blood on the streets also refers to Hera, who was known to have loved three cities for their broad streets. And being ox-eyed, of course, is mentioned in the oversized eyes like carbuncles. The red fiery nature of the pyrroles in Lanarin also shows up in the symbology of the Golden Fleece, as we read in Jason and the Argonauts. At that time did Jason uplift the mighty fleece in his hands, and from the shimmering of the flocks of wool, there settled on his fair cheeks and brow a red flush like a flame. Returning to the Wool Industries Research Association paper, we read that it is natural to assume that lanarin, the pigment of golden-colored wool, is derived ultimately from hemoglobin set free from broken-down erythrocytes. The suggestion is supported by the chemical composition of the pigment and by its undoubted pyrrolic nature. The red pyrrolic nature of the pigment lanarin is present not only in the red color of the soils on which merinos have historically grazed, but also in certain place names, including the Spanish Pyrenees Mountains. The words Pyrenees and Pyrrol both contain the root pyre, meaning fire and the morpheme wren, in both Pyrenees and the nearby Rennes-le-Chateau, suggests renal, pertaining to the kidneys that filter the blood and process urine while removing salt from the body. Red soil and its possible connection to the golden-fleeced merino, the pyrroles and iron oxide of its urine, the Pyrenees of its origin, and the black, gooey, alkaline nature of the isolated pigment might suggest a connection to the monatomic elements David Hudson found, under similar conditions, on his farm near Phoenix, Arizona, an area to which merinos were brought from the Pyrenees in 1598. According to Lawrence Gardner, the elements Hudson found were in the form of a white powder, anciently called firestone. It functioned as a replacement for the starfire produced by Isis and other female deities. Monatomic gold, or monatomic platinum, iridium, osmium, or any noble metal, is the ultimate end result of an alchemical process, the disincorporation of matter. In Hudson's patent for the preparation of orbitally rearranged monatomic gold, we see the central part played by the salt that began our story. When the salts are dissolved in water and the pH slowly adjusted to neutral, full aquation of the sodium gold diatom will slowly occur and chloride is removed from the complex. Chemical reduction of the sodium gold solution results in the formation of a sodium oride. Continued aquation results in disassociation of the gold atom from the sodium and the eventual formation of a protonated oride of gold as a gray precipitate. What's especially interesting about the nature of monatomic elements is their movement from an atomic microcluster into a single atom, symbolically represented by the cluster of gilded grapes in New Atlantis and the single grape of the tempest, the green sour ringlet, not bitten by the sheep. A 1989 article in Scientific American framed the idea in terms of Alice in Wonderland. Divide and subdivide a solid, and the traits of its solidity fade away one by one like the features of the Cheshire Cat to be replaced by characteristics that are not those of liquids or gases. They belong instead to a new phase of matter, the microcluster. 
This might explain why the process of converting salt into black alkali would eventually be patented as the Salve process, and why Merinos were such a valued breed, apart from their fine wool. If black alkali is the precipitate of monatomic gold, it might very well become a process that adepts would record, but in cipher, occulting its meaning into myth and legend, encoding the process into plays and compendiums to veil its overall significance. And it might be the reason why top-secret government surveillance facilities end up in very specific locations. As we can see, Pine Gap and Alice Springs are located at the very center of the island of Australia. Pine Gap also falls on the Sylvanite Triangle. As this line returns from Colorado to Kalgoorlie, it intersects the Pine Gap location at Alice Springs. Recall that Alice Springs was named for the wife of Sir Charles Todd, who worked under the astronomer royal Sir George Biddle Airy in the 1840s at the Greenwich Observatory. The Sylvanite Triangle has a strange relationship to Greenwich, as the triangle exactly intersects two prominent points on the international dateline. One, the point at which the dateline's deviation to the west is corrected, turning back due south. And two, the point at which the international dateline crosses the equator. The Prime Meridian was placed at Greenwich in London by Sir George Biddle Airy in 1851, though the Meridian has since been moved 334 feet further east. A Meridian refers to a location on the Earth at midday that is directly below the sun, placing it at the midpoint between sunrise and sunset. These are concepts closely related to the Mies, or the center of a musical scale the outgrowth of the ancient Greek concept of the mason, or center of a stone, from where we get the term stone mason. This is a discovery I first made and published in my book The Next Octave in 2021, and of course, no masons have ever confirmed it. Geographically, the mason, or Mies, plays a role in earthquake prediction, as explained on the Dutch Sense YouTube channel. When two earthquakes occur, Dutch sense is usually correct in predicting a third to strike at the center point or Mies between them. Just over a month ago, an earthquake as Mies showed up in central Australia. Normally, big quakes tend to follow the lines of the plate boundaries, like this one north of Australia. And on January 29th, 2024, a 5.1 magnitude earthquake occurred in Papua New Guinea, one of a series of earthquakes along the tectonic plate boundary located there. But three days later, on February 1st, 2024, a smaller 2.0 magnitude earthquake struck down near Perth in Australia. There are no plate boundaries here, and this small quake may have been caused by this intersection of power lines and their tower. Dutch sense sometimes finds power lines to be the cause of quakes. This is not to suggest there's anything evil or wrong about power lines, but we should be aware of the various effects that can occur involving low-frequency resonance in the Earth. With these two quakes forming the endpoints of a line or boundary, we could then predict a third quake to strike at the midpoint between them. And on the following day, on February 2nd, 2024, a 3.0 earthquake did strike at the midpoint of that line in Tennant Creek. A second 3.1 magnitude quake struck on February 3rd. An earthquake at the midpoint between two others is a readjustment for the entire boundary, from one point to the other. And this is also how the harmonic series adjusts as its structural matrix grows. The doubling growth of octaves could easily become cancerous and unmanageable. So each successive octave of growth causes every interval to cleave or divide at the center, the mes, adjusting the octave back into smaller, more manageable intervals 
so that no interval becomes too large and unsupported by the harmonic structure. We could even say this is a harmonic law. For every doubling, there's a correspondent having. For example, scaling up from the octave of 1 to 2, we're now in the octave of 2 to 4. But in response to this growth, the harmonic structure demands a division, which is the function of harmonic 3, the mise or perfect fifth of this octave. The new larger interval is filled, as Plato would say, with the mise, the arithmetic mean. The octave between 2 and 4 Hz is considered to be in the bottom range of ELFs, or extremely low frequencies, shown here in the frequency ranking table. The earthquake predictions that DutchSense makes are based on the behavior of a standing wave along a plate boundary exhibiting extremely low frequencies. Earthquakes can be triggered if a force penetrates the Earth that resonates with the Earth's low frequency. Resonance occurs when one object's vibrational frequency matches the resonant frequency of another, causing the second object to vibrate at the same frequency as the first, with no other outside force acting upon it. A good example is when a vibrating tuning fork can cause another fork, tuned to the same resonant frequency, to also vibrate, not because the second fork was ever struck, but simply because it's in vibrational sympathy with the first fork. In 1899, Nick Nikola Tesla calculated the natural frequency of the Earth to be right around 8 Hz. In 1901, he built Wardenclyffe Tower with a 300-foot ground buried in the Earth. According to Wikipedia, there was a great deal of construction under the tower to establish some form of ground connection, but Tesla and his workers kept the public and the press away from the project, so little is known. The descriptions include that the facility had a 10 by 12 foot wood and steel lined shaft sunk into the ground 120 feet beneath the tower with a stairway inside it. Tesla stated that at the bottom of the shaft he had special machines rigged up which would push the iron pipe one length after another, and I pushed these iron pipes, I think 16 of them, 300 feet. And then, the current through these pipes takes hold of the earth. In Tesla's words, the function of this was to have a grip on the earth so the whole of this globe can quiver. He was using the tower to resonate with the earth's natural vibrations, and one unintended result was triggering a small earthquake. In 1953, W.O. Schumann narrowed down the Earth's resonant frequency to 7.83 Hz, a value known as the Schumann resonance, again considered to be an extremely low frequency. Low frequencies tend to slow life down. For example, a 2015 study found that low-frequency sound waves delay the ripening of tomatoes, which may be why people have historically preserved their food underground. We know that frequency has a palpable effect on matter. For example, high-frequency vibrations can clean jewelry, but as this article in Tunneling and Underground Space Technology tells us, it is generally accepted that a low-frequency vibration has a greater possibility of structural damage than a high-frequency vibration, because the natural frequency of the structures is generally below 10 Hz. To move the Earth, you must speak the Earth's low-frequency language. Sir George Biddle Airy, the astronomer royal and boss of Sir Charles Todd mentioned earlier, also happened to write a book on sound and frequency in 1871. I quoted his book in an earlier video, as I was giving examples of various frequencies used to tune Middle C throughout history. Airy listed several possibilities, but included harmonic C at 512 Hz, noting its convenience due to its ability to be halved, or divided in half. For me, and my focus on the Mies, this seemed like an important observation on Airy's part. 
But in his book, Aries shares a mystery regarding the direction of frequency. In Article 95, he writes that there is a circumstance which we are unable to explain. It would seem possible that if we rang the bells upwards, from the lowest to the highest, inasmuch as each of the notes has good concord with the highest, we should derive from that series a pleasurable sensation. This, however, does not take place. The effect is unpleasant. This is the ring of eight bells that Airy was describing. The situation Airy describes calls to mind Ophelia's instruction to Laertes in Hamlet. You must sing a down, a down. Airy sees the jarring effect of ringing bells up as a mystery because each of the notes has good concord with the highest. This suggests that it was one of the lower bells of St. Mary's that may have been the dissonant one and it does seem that the lowest bells are usually the most out of tune. At 166.5 hertz, Big Ben's Great Bell, cast in 1856, is considered SLF, or super low frequency. We're told the Great Bell tolls the note of E though harmonically 166.5 Hz is a flat F. But even if we just compare the great bell with its companion bells, we find that it's incredibly out of tune with the higher octave E bell that starts the second of the Westminster quarters. This E registers at 340 hertz. Scaling it down to the previous octave, the great bell would have to be at 170 hertz for these two bells to be in tune, but they're 3.5 hertz off, making the great bell flat enough to perceive with the ear. When Paul McCartney performed at the London Olympics in 2012, the giant Olympic bell hanging on stage started to toll. Sir Paul told Enemy magazine that during the ceremony we had a sound glitch. There's this bloody great bell that we didn't know about. It was deafening. We were trying to figure out what key it was in, but it was in no key known to mankind. The bell was cast especially for the London 2012 Olympics, and features the quote from Caliban in The Tempest, Be not afeard, the isle is full of noises. There were several other Shakespeare quotes regarding bells that would have worked more poetically, so it's odd this line was chosen, likening the bell to nothing more than noise. And yet, maybe it was appropriate. The bell has been described as harmonically tuned, but the fact that one of England's most celebrated musicians was unable to determine its key suggests that maybe the bell did represent simply a deafening noise. According to the narrative, the Olympic bell won't be struck again because it's too loud. And yet we assume that because we hear them, these giant bells are meant to be heard. But what if they weren't always meant to be perceived by human ears? What if the sound waves some of these bells produce are simply meant to vibrate and agitate the ground? The year 2015 was the 100th anniversary of the Berkeley Campanile near San Francisco. To celebrate, three Berkeley professors, a composer, roboticist, and artist, translated seismic frequencies from the Hayward fault line into musical frequencies that the carillon bells rang out in real time. 
Listening to the performance, we can hear the dissonance of the seismic music and how similar that dissonance is to the David Shire soundtrack of the conversation. There's a borehole array at Embarcadero 4, three buildings down from the sculpture that looks like an organ pipe. Across the street is the ferry building with a clock tower that was inspired by the 12th century Giralda Bell Tower in Seville, Spain. At the top of each hour, the ferry building bells ring the Westminster quarters, presumably to feed the low dissonant frequencies down through the borehole array to start a conversation with the earth in the language of low frequency. The Berkeley Digital Seismic Network is said to have a data collection borehole right below the campus bell tower, which calls attention to what is surely a two-way connection, a conversation between the bell frequencies and the ground below. And it's worth noting that the Berkeley Seismology Lab's acronym for the Bay Area Regional Deformation Network, is BARD. The imagery calls to mind Ophelia's singing a down and Prospero's plan to send sound down into the ground. I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. This sending of sound down into the earth is meant to drown his book sounding very much like a liquefaction event. The art of plummeting sound into the ground requires intrusive objects, like Prospero's staff. Sixteen iron pipes stacked below the Wardenclyffe Tower, or the boresprit of Alonzo's ship. Maybe the Dewey Monument's very strong ground anchor, capable of withstanding a 7.9 earthquake, being fed mistuned, equally tempered musical frequencies every day by musicians in the park. Pine Gap's location on the Sylvanite Triangle puts it on alignment with Kalgoorlie, one of the four major deposits of sylvanite on Earth. Current mining operations in Kalgoorlie involve the super pit with the old Crookshank Sporting Arena oval situated right next to it. My friend Michelle Gibson has noted the presence of racing tracks in close proximity to airports in the same linear configuration all over the Earth, and she's hypothesized that they were part of the Earth's original energy grid system, which functioned as a circuit board. These oval tracks show up near mines as well. Open pit mines exist next to all four of the major sylvanite deposits. Chad of the Deeper Conversations with Chad YouTube channel believes large mines like these to be the dugout remnants of giant trees, which is entirely plausible as tree roots, even of normal size, can pilfer or transport gold up from the soil, making certain trees useful in locating underground deposits of gold. In this article, National Geographic states that researchers believe gold to have been taken up by the root system of the trees. And when Bacon was warning against applying medicines to tree roots in Experiment 500, due to the fact that the root draweth immediately from the earth, I don't think he was speaking temporally, nor was he referring to the tree drawing water. I believe he was referring to minerals in the immediate vicinity of the root which is a repetitive, though subtle, image in Renaissance literature. Aaron burying so much gold under a tree in Titus Andronicus, or the three cedars in the chemical wedding, directing Christian to the location of the wedded tellurides containing both gold and tellurium. In earlier videos, I explained that tellurides like sylvanite are compounds in which the element tellurium binds or weds with another, like gold or silver. In this video, on the telluride of calaverite, I showed tellurium to be the metaphorical sword in the stone of gold, 
which is why it was so necessary to pull the sword out in the first place. Once some king pulls out the sword of tellurium, you're left with a stone of pure gold. But tellurium is not to be confused with telluric lines, which are winding, snaking lines of energy that follow the flow of underground streams. According to Guy Underwood in his 1968 book, The Pattern of the Past, underground streams will often meet, forming a confluence that's termed a blind spring. Many cathedrals with bell towers were built on top of these springs and confluences, and it's not unreasonable to think their bells were transferring frequency, not only into the earth, but into these springs and the underground currents that connected them. If so, these bells aren't meant to send vibration through the air for the benefit of human ears, but through the soil and streams. In his book, Underwood includes a photo of osiers bending toward a blind spring, which calls to mind the story of Pyrene, meaning of the osiers, who transmuted herself into the spring in Corinth. It's also reminiscent of the leaning osier in Hamlet, the willow that grows aslant the brook in which Ophelia drowns. As the blog Chasing Tree states, Weeping willow trees seem forever bent in their search for water. When a winding telluric line curls into a spiral, it's called a dragon line. Beware of the dragons, the great telluric spirals. To kill them, impale them on a lance, and fix them in straight lines, channel their sinuosities. A sinuosity is the ability to curve, and it's this curving, twisting nature of fluid dynamics that was central to the life's work of Victor Schauberger. A telluric line spiraling in on itself appears as a serpent eating its own tail, and when the dowser says impale the spiral on a lance, he's referring to the act of redirecting telluric energy out of its terminus and back into directional movement somewhere else. People have been manipulating telluric lines for thousands of years, and the process has been woven into legend as the metaphorical slaying of the dragon. The name of the most prominent dragon slayer, St. George, contains the root geo of such words as geology, earth structure, and geometry, earth measurement. In this engraving of St. George, Albrecht Dürer portrays the turbulent, sinusoidal flow of the dragon's tail, almost identically to an underground stream's depiction in Underwood's book. To procure the golden fleece, Jason must also slay a dragon, which brings us full circle, back to the salt water, producing little seas of the merino sheep grazing on the red soil of the iron oxide Hera. The dowser Colin Bloy noted in the Journal of Geomancy that many underground springs terminate in huge double ram's horn spirals. We came to call them earth temples. It's no coincidence that we define the location of the spiral horns of rams, in this case a merino, as the temple. Just like above ground streams, it's possible for underground streams to contain alluvial gold deposited by the movement of water, as above, so below. It's assumed that it's the force of moving water that also loosens that gold from rock, but resonant low frequencies could accomplish the same thing. And this could explain why something like a large bell, intended to resonate with the Earth's low frequencies, would sound musically dissonant, vibrating in no key known to man. And in Scotland, we can see how a system involving bell frequencies might have been designed and used to loosen alluvial gold. This area of Scotland, Ochil Hills, is known for its alluvial gold deposits in its streams and burns. 
Looking at the larger region, we find that extending in both the east and west directions along the Ochil fault line are six ancient churches and cathedrals with bell towers. The Ochil hills are located in the center or mees of this line of bells, roughly halfway between St. Andrew's Cathedral and the Lus Parish Church. What makes this situation even more obvious is that four more bells were added to amplify the low frequencies, in a process that looks very similar to that of triggering quakes in the ground at the mees or midpoint of this set of bells. The dissonant music in the conversation, in relation to the topic of surveillance, seems to be a hint that not all frequencies are meant to entertain the ear. And the jarring, mistuned, jangled frequencies, especially of bells, are meant to do something else altogether. Just as governments had to provide the telegraph wire, and the cell phone signal before they could eavesdrop on the resulting conversations. Governments started a conversation with the Earth herself and are using her responses against her. And as the dragon spirals and cedar trees have been formed on her, giving us a map to the great chemical weddings taking place underground, those in charge have instituted the great chemical divorce, separating the Earth from its gold, whether monatomic, alluvial, or in rock. The one character mentioned many times, but not present in The Tempest, is Alonzo's daughter, Clarabel. The play begins as Alonzo, the king of Naples, returns home from her wedding to the king of Tunis, and the symbolism is deafening. Clarabel, representing the clarity of a bell, avoids setting foot on Prospero's isle full of noises. Instead, she's been elevated to the Queen of Tunis, a place name quietly suggesting the concept of being in tune. What's more, the location of Tunis occupies the Mies of northern Africa. But even though she's now Queen of Tunis, Clarabel retains her position as the heir of Naples, a city called Neapolis in ancient Greek. Funny how similar the root Nia is to the ancient Greek word Enia meaning nine. This makes Antonio's line full of extra meaning. How shall Clarabel measure us back to Naples, keep in Tunis? Alice in Wonderland was nine feet tall when she cried the pool of saltwater tears. The Dewey Monument in Union Square Park now has nine sections of its column shaft boring into the earth. N9 occupies the Mies position of the Mobius circuit. I'm thinking Francis Bacon was a little more prescient than we ever realized. I'm grateful for any feedback. Please leave your thoughts in the comments, and thank you for watching.